Welcome to a continuation of the Jimi Hendrix special. I'm Fakisha Combo, and we are here at 1600 Broadway at the Concrete Studios with two of Jimmy's best friends, Tahaka Alim and Tundera Alim. We're going to be talking about all the life that revolved around them and Jimi Hendrix. The records you just saw when we entered the program are gold records that were presented to the twins from the work that they did with Mr. Hendrix. So let's get it on, brothers. How did you come to know Jimi Hendrix? I'll let, I'll let you answer that today. Well, we got to know Jimmy. Uh, well, we sort of lived together. <laughs> I say sort of lived together because... Uh, well, um, Jimmy used to come in and out. Well, we had the same girlfriend. <laughs> what happened was uh, there was a young lady who later on became my wife. Her name is. Um, uh, got me a little confused. Does it, did we can edit this and all of it? You forgot his wife's name. <laughs> <laughs> June. Uh, June Vasquez. <laughs> well, what happened was. Uh, a, a mutual friend of Jimmy's and mine, uh, Faye Bridget. Faye had a, Faye had a friend named uh, June, who later on became my wife, who was a girlfriend of Jimmy's. And um, somehow when I came in the picture, I think um, it sort of moved Jimmy out of the picture with her. We sort of fell in love. And um, But Jimmy was still staying at the house at the time. So Where were you staying? We were living in the Park West Village. You know, we were living in the Park West uptown. Village, uptown, in Harlem, right on the outskirts. And uh, and, um, and and somehow when she and I got together, she was looking forward to me, you know, sort of like putting Jimmy out or something. I guess that's what her intention was. You know, I think sometimes now that I'm a little clear on the situation, it was almost like she was using me to get rid of him. And I guess she was probably trying to find someone else to get rid of me. It was like a, you know, a, a cycle, you know. But anyway, Re revolving door, revolving door, right? And uh, no, fortunately, oh. she, 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 she got, she got off and took she, the she took the escalator. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's going to revolve, <laughs> right? So um, what happened was, um, so this was my first opportunity. I had the, the chance to meet Jimmy. Of course, he wasn't the Jimmy Hendrix that we we all know now. He was a studying musician and uh, the, the beauty of the whole thing is uh, she wanted I know that her attention she had, she was wondering why I would allow this guy to stay in the house you know I mean I guess she beginning to think maybe there was something wrong with something going on with me and him or something you know but the real deal was I used to see this guy coming in every day with records different records and this guitar you know, and it sort of fascinated me because I had a little music background. I have a music back, musical background in my family, but I've never really seen a serious, studying, professional musician. And I noticed that his whole life was about music. You know, he used to bring these old blues records in, you know, like Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, I mean, all these great old blues records that when I was a kid I used to hear and say hey, that's wine on music but it wasn't wine on music because this guy was totally into it and he was studying all these licks you know but meanwhile she was pressuring me about getting rid of this guy but I was fascinated with this guy you know uh, studying this music the way he was studying it well studying at that time if I may if I may add you know studying because of course, again, like my brother said, we were involved in music and always was involved in music. Uh, uh, I think that we did have a knowledge of what study was because of my sister who was a pianist, right? And my brother and I would always take my sister to music classes. And so we, we really had a knowledge of, of what in, you know, intense study uh, uh, represented. 
but uh, uh, then we moved off into our level of, of, of music study, which was singing and, you know, hanging out into the, in the uh, hallways and doo wopping type, you know, drinking a little wine, drink a little wine, and had that little, but Jimmy was, Jimmy was almost a, a studying bum. You know, to a degree, you know, like you find people who stay in uh, college and just really study, you know, and they're afraid, even afraid to get out. But Jimmy and didn't was, care and didn't care yeah. where he lived. He, lived, where he, lived he didn't anything. care anything. He was, his concentration was so as almost as though he was on a mission. Right. He didn't care. And of either. course, this fascinated me. So it was no way in the world that I was going to tell a guy like this because I was fascinated over what he was doing and how intense his study was. So I wasn't about to say, get off. You know, I was about to tell her to get out. Oh, wait, 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 wait. How, did he, how did he come to be in the house together? Because he was living with the girl first well, and then you came with, the, with the girl prior to me. And then Faye introduced me to her and then I she and I was too intent. He was too for her. For her. <laughs> <laughs> <So> <laughs> So she was probably looking for a little more excitement, and his excitement was probably with his head. Muddy waters. Muddy you know? waters and all, you know, what he was doing. I was beginning to see that later on, you know, because he would always come in with the records. How long did you guys live together? Uh, it may have been about a year, a year and a half. You know, he was able to hang in there that long. He hung in for a year because after, after he and I became very close friends, she came with an ultimatum. Either I leave, or either she, or either he leaves, or I leave. So I gave, I said, well, look, sweetheart, you're going to have to leave. You know, I told you, you're going to have to leave because this guy was on a mission. I was obviously able to see this, you know. So uh, I wasn't about to try to get rid of him. How was Jimmy then? Jimmy may have been in his early 20s. Well, I would and say about 20, maybe or 21, too. Yeah, and about 22 years old, and I think I was about 17, 18 years old. I was very fast. So now, after he uh, stopped living with you, where did he live at the time? Was he still in Harlem? No, no. Well, what, if I, if I, what happened was he did because after he, uh, after after he had left that place, that's when he, that was. When he went to England, this went is to England. Oh, okay. Right, so he may have been about 23, 24. Okay. So in other words, he was living still in Harlem when he went down and played the Cafe yeah. Wall and all those places in the village. Yes, yes he was. Now, what was it like for him, for you and him when he came back to town after his success in, in Europe? It was um, surprising. It was surprising because remember, we didn't really know of his success you know, here in America, at least black Americans did, because we were so into, you know, the James Brown Sly Stone and, and all of that. So we weren't that familiar. You know, I remember hearing, oh, you remember your friend Jimmy? Oh, he became pretty big over in England. But you know, when people say that oh, over in England, that's like, you know, oh, so no big, yeah, no big thing, you know, what's happening here, you know? So, um, so we didn't realize the magnitude of his greatness. And so when Jimmy came back, you know, it was like, hi, you know, what's going on, man, you know? So he was, he gave us his, I remember him giving us a copy of his album, and we were like happy, you know, because like, he came back looking for us, you know, and he was so happy to see us that he you know, presented boy, us, you know, uh, boy made, made good and whatnot. So. Right. But we still, we, we weren't at the realization of how big he was, the magnitude. So, uh... He gave us a copy of the album, which we rushed home to hear. And when we heard well, it, well, of course, at that time we were looking to hear, uh, you know, James Brown. You know, it didn't sound oh, like James Brown. Brown you know, you know what so, happened? Right. So when we heard it, we were totally. Yeah. We were we, we 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 sad. We were sad for to, 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 you know, as James Brown. <laughs> Was this first was album, the first um, album? Are you experienced? Are you? Yes. No, 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 no. It was. It, it could have been. I, I don't know. No, it, it was. Are you experienced? Because are you experienced was really. Uh, um, it was a trip. No, it was no. A trip. Was it are you experienced? Uh, it was the. It was the one that had. Um, the mermaid. Mermaid. I shall return. That was. Oh, it was are you experienced? The, real, the very okay. close. Well, let me ask you this. What about 
the way Jimmy was uh, looked upon in Harlem when he was living, I don't, before we leave Harlem, and the clubs he had to play and the situation in the clubs in Harlem, uh, and the way he was dressed and everything. Well, most, most, see, you have to realize that what happened was he came back to Harlem. You understand now? And, and, and even when he, see, before he, before he was, uh, be, you know, before he came back from, or when he came back from Europe, or before he left for Europe, it was very hard. He used to do gigs with people, you know, and he would try to be a standout. But of course, that was not uh, to, 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 you know, he, it wasn't to much avail because people really was keeping him in the background. When he came back, he was trying to reestablish himself as a front man. Now, of course, again, in the uh, in the other world, in the rock world or in the white world, he was definitely recognized as a genius and recognized as something new and definitely innovative. In innovative. And then, uh, but as far as the black world was concerned, and which at that time the black world was home. Let's you know, let's face it, and they they did not recognize him at all. You know, they didn't recognize his style of dress. They didn't recognize his type of music. They didn't recognize him because, again, he did play a lot of. He was a very funky uh, uh, um, musician. But never, but, nevertheless, I'm mean, sorry to interrupt you, Don. But nevertheless, when he would play, like if we would go to uh, Small's Paradise, we go to any of the places in Hall, and he would play, he would turn the place out, no matter where he would right. go to play. So it wasn't that he wasn't accepted. He just wasn't programmed to the, uh, you know, he just wasn't programmed to the community, to that market, to that market. And of course, that goes back to uh, um, to his, uh, to the record company and to his management. I don't think that they had much uh, desire to program him in the, in those directions. They felt success was where it was, and so let's, you know, why rock the boat? We're going to talk about that in detail in a little while. Let me ask you about uh, the concert and the press conference that was held up in Harlem with Jimi Hendrix. Well, you know, uh, uh, let me see what you're trying to say there, Nikisha. <laughs> <laughs> I think you had something to do with that concert. <laughs> oh yeah, I see it. Okay, um, the, 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 what, what happened was, our objective was, because Jimmy, we began to uh, feel where he was coming from, of course, our, our closeness made us aware that he was trying to get more uh, in touch with the black community. And in, in that desire, it made us desire to do whatever we could in order to expose him to the community that he came out of and that he wanted to, you know, really present us a, a truly a part of. Uh, we, we, we felt as though uh, um, Jimmy had many times expressed his desire to do things like at, at places like Small's Paradise uh, again and uh, go uptown and, you know, you know, Apollo and things like that. And we tried to make arrangements to make that happen. Of course, we still, you still have to realize that we're dealing with an artist who was making at that time $125,000 a night. And... You could sit down with Jimmy for an hour. I could sit down with him for an hour, and it was very hard to make out sometimes what he was saying. Now, it could have been the LSD, <laughs> but no. But it, but it really was, wasn't because it really you could really it was the, Jimmy was. I mean, you know, like songs like uh, 19 um, what is it 1980 1990 uh, Merman I Show, show Return. Return. Well, it, it was times Jimmy would talk that way. You know, he could talk to you in that in that type of uh, this conversation would actually be, you know, a abstract, metaphor, abstract, abstract, yeah, metaphor, yeah. right? Yeah, you know, like, hooray, I'm waiting for my escape. <laughs> but he would get, the world is here to stay. You know, all the, okay. you know I mean, but he would do it in, he but would he would do it, do it in real conversation. In conversation that if you took the time to be able to break it down, 
well, if you were high enough at that point, and when I say high, I'm not saying that in the, in the derogatory. I'm talking about high spiritually. Yeah, spiritually. And, uh, you would be able to see. And, I, and it really, as, as Dole like become, the more I realized it, I think that he was, he was uh, um, trapped. He was trapped in in the world in a in a very uh, uh, platonic and and uh, um, what, what you call uh, in a world that really does not uh, elaborate on or allow. Spiritual, or allow spirituality to really address Rossi. itself in in its full bloom, especially a person being like considered that. Considered a freak or being or considered being, strange. Or, or, well, he always you know. talked about being out with the stars and you know yes. hearing music of the spheres right. yes. and not being able to put it into. Mm -hmm. To sound and put it into sound. Well, and yeah, colors well, all mixed together, kind of. Yeah, he was definitely into colors, and he was definitely into taking colors and making that reflect in his music. I'll, I'll never forget this. There was something that he did with a group called uh, um, uh, who was it? The uh, Last Poets. I remember. I'll never forget this. It was a song called Doriella Dufontaine. Are you familiar with that? Very right. Much. Oh, okay. Well, that particular song. Uh, really uh, um, accentuate some like rap. It was well, of course, the last poets at that time were what the premier rap type or the precipitators of rap. And and what happened was uh, uh, Jimmy, of course, did something with them. And that song was called Doriella Dufontaine, and it really uh, um, highlighted, accentuated the combination of color and story. You know what I'm saying? Painting or painting pictures. Painting pictures. You know, because he was really into painting. And he would accentuate things, you know, not just to be playing, but to uh, to actually bring out highlights and so on. And that really did a very so good job. color and sound are one. Yeah. Right, Trying absolutely. To, to get that, so that, that seemed to have been his, his forte, is to put the color and sound to make it one. To, to make, make it one. Feel, feel color. Yeah. And well, see sound. It uh -huh. created, it created, um, even within us, uh, more as we as we evolved in in music it really was our uh, it was our uh, lessons. lessons because what we did we, we uh, ghetto ghetto fighters further moved on and we started doing things and our things really lent itself towards that type of stuff which which was uh, part rap part uh, uh, music and taking colors goes all the way back to uh, Peter and the wolf type stuff you know back in uh, back in back in the day but actually bringing it into uh, our our sound and our music. The Ghetto Fighters, of course, was a group that you guys used to have. Yes, right. we were the group. We were the background group for Jimmy. Right. What about Jimmy and his Corvettes? <laughs> yeah, Jimmy had a. Uh, uh, well, you want to yeah. Jimmy? Jimmy? Jimmy liked to wreck cars. You know, I don't know if, if you know that, but he, he he used to like to wreck cars. And he may have had this uh, this uh, uh, young yeah, funny the easy rider. Comes what comes on? Yeah, <laughs> come on at that time, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, Jimmy he knew that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because uh, Jimmy bought he he bought this uh, Stingray, a Corvette, mm -hmm. Corvette, 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 Stingray, yeah. um, and metallic. Metallic. I'll never forget metallic. it. Was really beautiful, beautiful. And, beautiful. beautiful. And, and during that time, we I had a um, a pimp mobile. Well, it was Cadillac, you know. And um, but I've never seen uh, a black guy during that time with a you know because we were into I mean, at least in Harlem we were into Cadillacs. Mm -hmm. But Jimmy was different, right. you know. <laughs> yeah. He had the Corvette, you know, and it was a beautiful one. So we decided to leave the Cadillac, and the three of us would pile into this Corvette, and you know, and, and, and that's exactly what it was. We, 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 so we piled yeah. in the Corvette, and we went to, you know, where, where the After Hours spot. Yeah. <laughs> <Right. laughs> we went to the After Hours spot, had fun. I mean, you know, we. Well, of course, you got to understand that, I mean, you know, time was really something, the time was really moving at an accelerated speed, so we always found ourselves in an after hours, <laughs> because we needed after hours, because there wasn't enough time, <laughs> there wasn't enough time in the day. <laughs> <laughs> I so, mean, we were on top of the world. <laughs> you know? so, what, so what happened was, um, so after Jimmy got it, what he needed and what he needed in the after hour spot, which was, you know, see a few people and uh, do, do a few things, do, do a few things and say a few, say a few, say a few lines, <laughs> you know. So afterwards, we decided, okay, it's time to go. 
So it may have been around four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning. You know, daybreak is probably breaking, and uh, everyone seeing at that point began to follow us. You know, they began to realize, oh, here's Jimi Hendrix. You know, okay, so now it's time for us to make our great escape. You know, so now they're following us down the stairs. We're moving pretty fast. We're looking good. We're looking, looking good. good. Yeah. We think we do. Hendrix and crew. You know, you know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're in <laughs> <laughs> Just the three of us. Just the three of us. You know, right. it's time to get in the car and make yeah. our getaway. If if the car, if we could have snapped our fingers and the car drove up to us, that would have even been greater. But right. you know, we had to walk to it. You know? Right. But we. But that was okay because the crowd was coming more. Right. Right. Cool. More. So, oh, are you Jimi Hendrix? And then I guess our job was that. Uh -huh. Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. you know, oh, wait a minute. Got to play it off. <laughs> you know. So you do it. Right. Jimmy jumps in the car and says, "Come on, let's go, y'all." So we jumps in the car and we getting ready to make it now. Now the, the crowd is building up. Remember, after our places are closing, and it's now everyone is there. We're the uh, center of the town. Roll out the window, Jimmy. Roll out the window. An autograph. Okay, I'll even sign one. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 you know. So the autograph right. after we did All right, now roll up the window. Let's show. Everything was was uh, time. Time. Perfect. And it was it, it was almost planned. Well planned. Okay, this is almost every night. The, oh, yeah, well, this particular night it became, a routine, it became a, a routine, so we knew how to do it. <laughs> Right. We knew we knew the escape. We knew how to how to how to play it. And we knew how, how to time it. How to time. We it. knew how to get on out and how much how much dust to blow when the car takes it's off. So, you know, so now it's finally, perfect. so okay, Jimmy, let's go. And uh, all right, pull on off, Jimmy. Pull on off. Pull off, Jimmy. Let's go. Let's go. A brand new Corvette. Brand new Corvette. I can't stop it. It's starting. It is starting. Now the crowd, everybody, everybody's looking. I'm ready to say it. You know, even they knew. It was almost like. You know, boom. I mean, the people know that how the escape is supposed to supposed happen. They're all part of the plan. You know, you know what? Even the people are part of it. Yeah, they're know? stars. I mean, they know this whole thing. They create these. Now, <laughs> now, now, wait, wait a minute. What the hell are we going to do? You mean we can we get, get out? <laughs> Do we get out and leave the show out and let our get show yeah. vulnerability, or do we just stay here yeah. all night? <laughs> <laughs> at this point, at this point, you know there are no car, there are no phones in the car, of course. So we can't so call, we call can't AA. Call AA. AA. We can't do anything. And we can't even call AA. <laughs> yeah, right. we can't call AA. So no AA or AA, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> we needed both of them at that point. Right. But, so uh, so what we decided, so we stayed in the power. <laughs> We stayed in the car to powwow a little, you know. We figured, okay, let's see how we, we got to make out. this look like. We got to make this look, look like, like um, it's the cars for Yes, we have nothing to do. We 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 did. Now I think the sun, you know, it was it was now bewitching hours. The sun is coming out now. People are walking away. If they were vampires, we would have been. We would have burned. Right we would have been burned. It was over. <laughs> and now, now it's like, damn, Jimmy, what's wrong with this car? We should have brought the Cadillac. You know, I mean, now, now we are. Now we're like um, the Swipe Boys no, car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, that's how we're we're talking about this white boys car. What is this? You know, you should have been in in, in, the, in the. You're embarrassing us. You're embarrassing us. Uh, Why you buy this piece of shit? You understand? What is this for? And. Uh, and, and would you believe? I think he crashed the car. The, after that, he right. didn't want the car right. anymore. Finally, that was yeah. it. He so got we, yes, rid of no, the car. we got out. We had yeah, we did have a cab. Uh, you you want us to go through the whole thing? No, but wait a minute. He, he he continued to buy other Corvettes though. Didn't oh yes, he? Yes, oh, yes, he did. Yes. Well, he, he just got he rid of like, that he one. He got rid of that, that one. one because it wouldn't start that one. Right. Day. Because it wouldn't start, and that's the way he was. He was the type that would, you know, he was very was an embarrassing. Moment. Now, how do you of come course. back? It, it's not like same one. You have to change colors at least. Right. Exactly. Let me ask you, you guys, this. Okay, Jimmy was a multiracial. Uh, kind of guy who didn't really say, you know, he preferred one woman over the other. But uh, so much of what we read about never talks about his black women. Mm -hmm. uh, what about Devin and Faye and Pat Harley? Or mm -hmm. tell me something about his relationships with those women. Would you like to deal? Would you like to elaborate on well, that? Well, I don't know why when you take over. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Somebody go ahead. talk about go that. Right ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Start off with with Faye because Faye was truly, you know, a, a, not only his main woman, but I would say Faye was one of his best friends. You know, I mean, there was a relationship with Faye and Jimmy that superseded as much as you know. I mean, as much as I love Devin, you know, they superseded all of that because it was not just a sexual 
situation. It was I'm not saying that Bevins was only sexual, but uh, I just so happened to know that Faye's relationship with Jimmy was definitely a special relationship. Yeah. And, and that's why I mentioned to you, you know, and this is for you, sweetheart, you, Faye. <laughs> you know, um, uh, make sure that Felicia sees some of those um, letters. Yeah. Allow her, you know, I know how you are, <laughs> you know, I know you. You know, but allow her to see some of those letters so she could see the beauty of uh, Jimmy's, the way he wrote letters and the way he would print. You know, I told her so much about this, baby. So I want you to do this, do this for daddy. Okay, baby. <laughs> uh, yeah, and now. And because Faye was with him in Harlem when he was. Yes. You well, know, Faye, I've heard about Faye's him. relationship, Faye, Faye, Faye is the type of person, as a uh, matter of fact, that, uh, uh, it's very easy to love you know i mean she's a very 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 powerful very strong strong uh minded woman fate fate uh, uh you know even though i i shouldn't say could have been because she, i'm sure she succeeds in whatever she wants to succeed uh jimmy always wanted to record i and and i and i still don't know why now uh she was one of the uh she was a stylist well, she is a stylist in her in her uh, um, great blues, blues approach. Great writer, wow! Right, even and plays the guitar. First time I ever heard that. Oh, and played yeah. guitar I'm as well. Forward to meeting her. Yeah, and and uh, she's shy, so you know you gotta bring it out. Okay. I can hear her laughing now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about Devin? Devin, Devin was uh, Devin probably reminded uh, Jimmy of fate, if anything, you know, because. Um, they had they had somewhat uh, similar types of attitudes, but but Faye was much stronger. Uh, in a in a man's life, you know, in a in a person like Jimmy's, you know, uh, um, there are many platonic relationships. You know, of course, because he had it like that, and that's the way it was for him. You know, uh, uh, he had those opportunities, but but uh, um, I think that he also um, relished relationships with people like Faye. Devin at that time was very close and very, uh, very, a very sensitive young lady, very sensitive. And I think that uh, Jimmy respected that sensitivity. Welcome to another edition of Case International. I'm Fakisha Cumbo, and we're continuing with our special on Jimi Hendrix. We're at Concrete Studios, 1600 Broadway, with the twins, who are Jimi Hendrix's best friends, Tahaka and Tundra. So let's get started here. Fellas, tell me about the men who had something to do with Jimi's career. Let's start off with uh, Alan Douglas. Okay, Alan Douglas. I don't remember meeting Alan. You know, Alan, very graceful. Was that Brown? Al Brown was a yeah, Brown was a musician, one of the great black musicians. Introduced us to uh, Alan Douglas. Alan Douglas is, well, I could say is. Alan Douglas is a, uh, a genius. You know, Alan, you know, had was managing a couple of groups at the time. John McLaughlin was one of the groups. He was dealing with the uh, Last Poets, who was one of the uh, precipitators in rap. And he had another uh, another group that he was dealing the with. Poets, right? yeah, the Last Poets, right? Yeah, Last Poets. Yeah, yeah. John McLaughlin. But I well, think what's Alan's, his relationship now with the uh, estate? Well, uh, it, well, let's let's go back because I think you would have to go back in retrospect of uh, Alan was one of the people who wanted to bring Jimmy a little bit closer towards the jazz um, uh, outlet, uh, which is something that Jimmy really wanted to do. Alan, of course, was affiliated with jazz artists at that time. And so I think that that's basically where that uh, uh, that connection came. And Al, was, Al Brown was quite uh, um, uh, aware. aware of Jimmy's desires musical and needs, desires. musical desires and needs, and so therefore he introduced him to Alan Douglas, and Alan Douglas uh, uh, proceeded in trying to make that type of connection, and which he did. Uh, there are some tapes that Alan do have, again, as I told you, with The Last Poets, and also with John McLaughlin. 
which was which was really uh, interesting. You know, I I must admit I've heard some of the tapes that Jimmy did with John McLaughlin and he burned them up. But nevertheless, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, another thing when I think of Alan Douglas, is two things that I think of: chickpeas. <laughs> yeah. Chickpeas, because he was always conscious of uh, his eating habits, you know, and he was always eating chickpeas and, and vegetables. How know? did he become part of the uh, estate as it stands right now? Yeah, I think obviously that's he was one of the ones who musically could hold on to that type of situation and could possibly develop it and do the thing which he tried to do, which he tried to do, you know, uh, from one level to, to another, to another, to another level. A lot of it I may disagree with, but uh, obviously he is the best known because he was the elder at the time and he knew what he was doing because it landed in his hands. Well, you know, I was reading uh, John McDermott's book, yes. Setting the Record Straight, yes. and he says that Chas Chandler told, Jimmy told Chas, he wanted him to work with Alan, but he didn't want Alan to have any control or have anything to do with his music. But, well, you know, uh, uh, it, that's because Jimmy, being an artist and being alive, of course, he wouldn't want anybody to have, Jimmy didn't want nobody to have control of his music. You know, uh, I think that if Jimmy was alive today, he'd be the one in control, but he's not. You know uh, what I'm saying? And, and so, and that, how, how, hmm. I, I'd like to just elaborate on that, you know. Um, I don't blame him. I mean, I wouldn't want Alan controlling my music either. You want him controlling yourself? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, again, again, uh, Alan is now the the head of this. Or I know he has control of this state right now. And uh, um, that Alan did. You know, remember, Alan was not a, a musical genius of, on the level of Jimi Hendrix, and it'll be very rare that you'll ever run into someone that great. But you know, uh, Alan is the one that had to do what he had to do, and I, and I, I must commend him because he keeps the legacy alive. I understand that uh, Al Hendricks now uh, is contesting, I don't know whether it's Leo Brandon or yeah, somebody yeah. like that, mm -hmm. uh, the situation with uh, the estate, and mm -hmm. because I understand that he was given something like $50,000 a year. Yes. And uh, from what I hear, what I've read, Jimmy's records are still selling like three million a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so. I'll just put it this way, you know, Al, Al, you know, with all due respect to, to Al, Jimmy's father, you know, at the time when Alan Douglas took control of the state, I don't think Jimmy's father was that in tune to what was going on musically, you know, so it was very little that he probably could have done at that time to really hold on and do the things to to Jimmy's you know, music Korea. and career yeah. that, that, that Alan, Alan Douglas, Jimmy. who was in, in business, the business right? yeah. and, and was heavily involved in the business. Now, of course, I'm sure politically there's a lot of uh, controversy involved in that. But the only thing that I could just uh, deal with right now on the level that I'm that we're looking at it is on a musical level. And I think that uh, um, if if there was someone better, then they should have stood up then. You know, now I'm sure I'm sure that there's a lot of things, a lot of negatives and positives, and you know, to go along with it. But of course, with every negative, there's going to be, or with every positive. Okay. Um, how about uh, the mafia and Jimmy? Um, from things I've read, that he had some problems uh, trying to get Electric Lady on Eighth Avenue and mm -hmm. something around the Salvation Club and about being kidnapped at one time well you know uh, again fortunately we were spared from a lot of that you know being you know like little brothers i can't know, like, when, let me yeah, just okay. finish on that um there was a little there was incidents that we happened to have been a part of but as far as that getting the electric lady that's why we have to commend um uh, michael jeffries because it is there so obviously, whatever they had to go through at that time, Michael was able to uh, circumvent. circumvent and get it done. And a lot of what Jimmy's desire. Jimmy what about wanted, the time like, that well, Jimmy was I, I kidnapped? Like to, I like to say, I like to say this as well. You know, I like to say, let me add this to that. Uh, um, Jimmy was affiliated with Reprise Records. Reprise or Reprise was owned at that time, and I think it still might be owned by Frank Sinatra. You understand, Frank Sinatra? Yes. 
Yes, Frank Sinatra Frank many Frank times I used times. to write, uh, write Hendrix and one. say to Jimmy, uh, if you ever have any problems or anything, please, you know, call me. If you so, ever need, and if you ever need me. And so I can't see that being what they say it is. If Frank Sinatra is who he, you know, people say he is. Right. So I don't know. That's kind of hard to hear believe. about him getting kidnapped. Yeah, yeah I think Jimmy staged that. Yeah. <laughs> to get away? Yes, to get away. <laughs> yes. That's the way he was. Right. Very dramatic. Very dramatic and very uh, uh, theatric. What about Jimmy and... Did you hear about him disappearing? Jimmy disappeared in front of everybody. No, I never heard about that one. Yeah, Did right. he go up in a puff yeah, of smoke? He, puff, he, he, just... he was naked. He, he, was, <laughs> what about... he was naked and he, and he told everybody he was invisible. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm serious. That's serious. Like, Where was this at? He was at a party. <laughs> yeah. He said, I, he said, everybody said, Jimmy, house. Jimmy, he said, after I was fine, right. And everybody said, Jimmy, you but naked. I know he the said, no, I'm like in, that, though, he said, they? Right, they love him. He said, Jimmy, Jimmy, you're naked. No, I'm invisible. <laughs> well, what was, well, let's get a little more deep here now. Uh, what was Jimmy's relationship with the Black Panthers and the Young Lords? Uh, Okay, um, if you, well, let's take one at a time. Let's go back, let's go to the Young Lords. The Young Lords, um, you know, had a lot to do with the uh, last poets. You know, there was a combination there. So, again, Felipe, Felipe Allen, Piano, right. and that was all of that. Right. right, so, and that was all a part of Alan Douglas's clan. Right. Okay, you know? now, I read somewhere that when Jimmy played Randall's Island, mm -hmm. The young yeah, lords that. held him at night point and made him stay and play or something. Is that all poppy uh, talk? Yeah, I, I remember that particular show. I don't remember any of that. Okay. Now, I, now I did, and I was there. I was at the show. So if it happened, it happened, you know, I, you know, without me seeing it. And I was a little kid that was either I was either I was zonked. Okay, or, so that didn't happen. Yeah. Well, then what about the times of? But I did hear about that. Okay, there were other times that they said that the Panthers were forcing him to do things. Panthers, uh, was that just a writer no, I, that I was reading? I, you know, it didn't seem so real that. to me. Let me, let me, say, let me yeah. say one thing, yeah. please. I must. I must. Because see, I think what you're, I think what's being confused here, is see there was a, there was an incident with uh, uh, an, a group called the Fair Play Committee, and I think that's what you're probably talking about. Okay, and but before you do, but there was the Panthers during that time. The Panthers used to sell their papers on A Street. So when Jimmy and us would leave the studio, we run into the Panthers selling their newspapers. You know, and they would always confront us and say, uh, uh, paper, paper, they knew Hendrix, you know, hey, paper, Jimmy, you know, and perhaps maybe we, we bought a paper or Jimmy bought a paper and they wanted to know why we didn't buy one and Jimmy wanted one and we did. Or but there were not any, that, as you know, of any confrontations or no something like that. The, the, the major confrontations came were... from, the major confrontations came from, uh, uh, from probably uh, two elements. One of them being the Fair Play Committee, and the Fair Play Committee was a very good and no uh, a reputable organization. It was in Harlem. You understand? Now they were affiliated with a lot of these people, but the Fair Play Committee were uh, many times um, they were they had expectations of Jimmy, you know, for, you know, of and for Jimmy, and they wanted Jimmy to do things. You understand? For him or for the organization, Jimmy. Jimmy probably would have done it because Jimmy did a lot of things, you know, impromptu, and he would do and benefits and, benefits and did a lot of things. Uh, what <laughs> happened? Yes, I mean, got in a lot of trouble exactly too, right? right? But I so, think that so. what happened was uh, with the Fair Play Committee, they they was uh, their anxiety created caused them to do because there was a time when we said that we would do something for the Fair Play Committee. And it was never really established. It was never in contract. And they went on and moved ahead and started promoting and doing promoting shows and whatnot without in the name permission. of Jimmy without his permission. And what they didn't understand is Jimmy loved contracts. He loved to sign contracts. <laughs> yeah. And if they only understood that, they all they had to do was bring him yeah, up. <laughs> <laughs> but if he didn't give him a contract, then he Jimmy he had his way of being upset, you know. And he and he got upset. And very strong about it. But that organization. Was, that, was, that organization was an, a somewhat part of, a, I guess, an underground type situation. Right. And that created a major hostility between that organization and the Hendrix, Hendrix and ultimately the Hendrix camp. Let me ask you this. Uh, at one point, Jimmy was arrested in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, 
because he they found uh, a, a illicit drug in his uh, case possession. Uh, he was acquitted of that. Was that drug planted, in your opinion? You know, the '60s was a real weird time. You know, the '60s was a period where you know everybody. I think even President, one of the presidents, um, uh, mentioned or all somebody, the presidents men. All of them. They, all of them everybody had drugs on them at that time. I mean, let he who didn't have drugs stand up. I mean, you know. You know, that so didn't answer my question. I, what I just was asked, it planted? in your opinion, was it planted? Yeah, probably by I Jimmy. Think. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Okay. Because, well, because in fact, you know, uh, um, Jimmy was a known drug user. Yeah, but I heard he'd never used heroin, no? Oh. I mean, I don't know. That's what they found in this. Yeah. Computer. No, they didn't find heroin. That's what they talked about in the books, that yeah. it was heroin. Yeah, but they didn't find heroin. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and if they did, I'm sure that he was just bringing it to a friend. Oh, okay. Old lady or something. All right. <laughs> maybe, maybe the balloon That's popped cold. in his stomach. I don't know. <laughs> That's pretty cold. Okay, let's get a little serious here okay. now. And I want to talk about the mysterious death of Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. Let me.